I'm Sophia Cole. I work for a media company in the UK called ITV, and I've probably been doing Scala around two, two and a half years. Um, something I'm really, really passionate about is breaking down the barrier to technology, um, for the opening up a space for people who don't just get it. Um, I've noticed a lot of scary sounding jargon isn't really necessary. Most tutorials start with quite complicated problems. And this Blue Sky Scala, I don't know if anyone's seen Jessica Kerr's talk in Scala Exchange 2016 in London. It was brilliant. I highly recommend it. So she talks about Blue Sky Scala being kind of in the middle of this space of, of learning the basics and, and the really difficult stuff. So in the first six months I learned Scala, it was um, enough to get by. It was enough to create production um, software. But it wasn't really, really, really functional. And about a year after starting, I decided to really delve into that. So what I did next, so I decided to prioritize a few concepts to focus on because I think it could be overwhelming having lots and lots and lots to look at. So I decided to choose things that I thought would bring the most value really quickly and um, something that I would organically find through the code so I have some context to learn within. So I think the first one I chose was uh, immutability. So this is the notion of unchanging code and it's something that functional programming kind of prefers. It allows us to reason about the code more easily and allows us to handle concurrency because you know whatever you're accessing isn't changing. Uh, another thing that I decided to concentrate on is not throwing exceptions throughout the code. So this is when you return something other than what you've defined in the return signature. Uh, this brings side effects which is also not preferable in functional programming and also allows you to reason more about the methods that you've um, decided to write. And the last one is um, function signatures and what I mean by this is thinking about what your inputs and your outputs are before writing the code on the inside. I tend to use the three question marks um, and this really forces you to decide what your function is doing the what and the how rather than the who and the what. So really making a design choice. Um, it also forces you to decide how you're going to handle failure. So all of these things combined uh, gave me um, something to focus on and I decided to focus that and apply it with validation and Daniela did a great job, yeah, did a great job of explaining all that for me so I don't have to go over it again. Um, so Yes, I decided to choose validation to apply these. So we all agreed that returning um, one message wasn't great, so we wanted to turn a function that was currently throwing exceptions to compile a list of messages to return to the user. So that's how I went about compiling all those concepts and applying them in the real world. So that's what I'm learning. This is more about how I'm learning. I think this is much more important. So the first thing I think is important to say is that I learned primarily through pair programming. So do any of you guys do pair programming on a daily, weekly basis? Okay. Not that many, actually. I've asked this before in other places, and a lot more hands went up. I think the more you do it, the better you find it, and the better you are at it. Um, it's perfect for sharing knowledge, especially when there's a more experienced person and a less experienced person, as long as the more experienced person kind of sits on their hands a bit and lets the... Um, the other person explore and discover things. I will say I noticed after the first few months that I needed space to explore and I felt guilty about kind of wasting the other person's time. So I think it's important for someone to realize and recognize when they need an, an alternative way of learning and exercise that. So go away and figure things out. So the way that I did that was practice, 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 practice. Um, so as I said, the other person in the pair is your comfort blanket, is your safety net, and you get very comfortable pairing with them and learning new concepts with them. Going away and doing it on myself was, doing it by myself was very daunting, and I kind of panicked, and I didn't know what direction to go with, and that other person had gone. So the best thing I did for independent learning was do carters. So, so carters is a thing where you keep doing the same exercise over and over again. So I'd pick up a carter, do it, go and look at other people's um, solutions and then apply some of the concepts to the next Carter I pick up. So I found that super useful. Um, I've also done the Coursera course, which I think is really good. And I've just started with the Red Book. 
Uh, something I will say with these courses and stuff is persistence. I think so I've run into a few of the um, exercises quite early on that I found really difficult and maybe stopped, but when I went back to it and carried on, I could do the next. So, so just because you can't do X doesn't mean you do, can't do Y uh, in the different topics. Um, so my advice for this was throw yourself in. Um, I found I had to really commit to the learning experience for a few weeks just to get the basics and absorb it. Um, and that's how I got the most benefit. Uh, there's plenty of resources. These are the some that I recommend and I've tried. Uh, there's, there's loads. I'll share a list of these later. Um, but they're really, really useful. Um, and the last one is making mistakes. So I touched on this in peer programming. I think it's really important. And it's more of the mindset change that you need when you, uh, on this topic. So realizing that it's a necessary step and knowing what and why something is wrong is just as important as learning what's right. So I thought that was really important too. Um, so what are the challenges with this and the things that I'm still facing? Uh, the first learning curve I found was introducing a helper library for functional programming such as CATS. Uh, it can almost feel like learning a new language. It can feel like there's all these tips and tricks you need to learn to get it right. Um, but it's important to remember that you you can implement these gradually. So I found stripping the problem back. So with that validation problem, we went into a room and we stripped it back to the most basic validation problem we could, we could make, uh, learned about it step by step, asked plenty of questions, and I found this enables us to shed any assumptions before starting. Um, I think I was speaking to a trainer once, with um, a Scala trainer once, and he said, I asked him, what do you do when someone just doesn't get it? And he said, keep asking questions. There aren't without any yes or no answers, so open-ended questions. And you'll soon discover there's something, there's an assumption somewhere that somebody has, which means that they're getting stuck with a concept later on. So that's really important. And then we kept building that up until it was a, a real-life problem back to where we were, in the, which we'd found in the code. Um, the second challenge, I think, is having helpful feedback. Um, in that talk, I mentioned Jessica's talk. She talked about this incremental step from... Java-like Scala to functional Scala, and you introduce bits and bits. And when you're at the bottom end of the stairs, having feedback from someone who's expecting you to be at the top end of the stairs isn't very um, helpful to you. Uh, so having a mentor there is great. That's perfect. That's, that's great. But um, some people don't have that. And for this point, I really encourage everyone to get out into the community and help, because it's just going to make the community better. Um, the great few initiatives are Scala Bridge, I think you have over here in the US. Some in the UK that we have that maybe um, there's some equivalents is Code Bar, which helps underrepresented um, groups in technology, and Code Club, which is encouraging developers to get into um, schools and help children learn too. Uh, and the third one is um, another learning curve. So I think if you write Hello World in Scala and then look at the red book, so the Functional Programming Scala book, that change that difference is crazy. So these courses don't follow, I find they don't follow a steady diagonal line upwards, and I don't think they should. They're in topics, and the different exercises um, touch on the different topics. But as I said earlier, just because you can't do X doesn't mean you can't do Y. So really explore the different ones before kind of giving up and, and letting it go. And then revisit when you have more self-confidence, and then you'll feel really good about doing something you couldn't do before. Um, so as I said, one step at a time. When you're um, approaching these exercises, I think when I see a problem for the first time, I get really excited about what I want to write down. And then I have all these questions in my mind about what about this, or oh, I can't do that because of this. And then I forget the original point. I just like to get it all down, start writing code. You can always delete. That's the great thing. Um, so that's good, and you can see the solution a bit more objectively. And then I tweak and replace code as you go along. Oh, I didn't need that, but I do need this, so I replace it. And that leads me on to my next point of it doesn't have to have a click moment. I think with lots of things in life, you rely on this yes moment, which can put a lot of pressure on you. Um, so expecting that click moment can actually be quite detrimental. Um, as I said, when I solve a problem, it's very gradual. It's replacing and, and tweaking. And that kind of might take away from the, the click moment. But um, hard work and motivation and persistence is what will get you to the end goal. Um, 
And lastly, which everything went really quickly actually, everyone is really, really different. So there's absolutely no pressure. What someone will learn in a day, another person will take a week, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their understanding is going to be any better in the, in the end. Um, yeah, that's basically all I wanted to encourage. I really wanted to encourage everyone to help and be allies and mentors and um, realize that not everyone will just get it and everyone has different paths and all that good stuff. Um, so thank you. Uh, any questions? Um, I found by default I was pair programming in work a lot, uh, pretty much most of the time, and then going home and doing those Carter exercises at home. Obviously, that's not possible for everyone. Um, Times when I would break out in my peers at work were if I'd been explained a problem, and I, I think I got it. I think I got it conceptually, but I hadn't really applied it myself, and I wanted to explore a little bit more. Um, you know, you should really have a trusting relationship with the people you pair with. So, giving giving them a little nod, go for a bit of coffee, or um, anything like that is probably a good thing. Um, in our team, it works well once a week, or um, I've been in another team that do every day a switch so that everyone gets a chance at a ticket and the knowledge is shared, but I find that can be a little bit, you lose the ownership of your, of your ticket and you don't have that great moment at the end when you've done it. So a week, I think, has been a lot better for me. So I haven't completed it. I'm probably um, chapter five, I think. I've been um, in a group where we look at it through the week and then we come together and talk about it, but that didn't quite work because either you've done it and you've done it or you haven't done it and um, yeah, you just haven't got as much to say. So I was reading through it and doing the exercises. I think that's why. Did Have you done it that way? Have you done it? No. no. Oh, okay. Oh, I think the exercises are the best part. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think I've been in a position where we've had that person who knows everything in the team about one particular part and then they've left and then you're stuck. And I think even though it's really painful at the time to um, not go to that person who knows the answer and figure it out yourself, um, it's probably good to just ask them for ad advice rather than pair with those. I've been in situations before where one person's known a lot about something and somebody hasn't known a lot about something and they've paired and the person who knows a lot has been the navigator and just sat on their hands, just using, explaining things, talking to them um, and then the person who doesn't know as much is kind of the driver so they have to learn how to do it in order to uh, write the code. Um, yeah, I think we can all agree somebody who has the you know, a depend any, anytime you've got a dependency on a person is probably um, not a great situation to be in. You need to share it and share everything. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, okay. I, um, I come from a place called Wales in the UK, and we speak really, really quickly. <laughs> um, the initiatives to help a mentor or the resources to learn on your own? Uh, sorry? The, the, the oh, OK. So we have some really great stuff in the UK. One's called Code Bar. Um, 
or one word lowercase. And it's a really great um, place where people come to underrepresented people in technology, people might, that might feel intimidated in certain meetups and things. They go along with an idea or a personal project and then you would, well, the more experienced people would volunteer as mentors. And then at the beginning of the session, somebody will stand up and say, I want to work on this. And then a mentor will say, oh, well, I can help you with that. And you go off in pairs or threes. And it's really, really rewarding because they're really excited to do, um, to do things. So that's really nice. And there's another one called Code Club. And um, mentors can um, apply for Code Club. You need to get certain um, things to say. You can work with children. And you go in for um, an after-school club and they give you all the resources you need to teach um, coding. But there's also Scala Bridge in the US. Um, I don't know as much about that because I haven't got involved with that, but I think it's workshops for um, women to get into technology. Scala Bridge. Oh, that was loud, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Ah, that's a good one. Um, I've been in a team before with more disagreements. Um, what did we do? It's a good question. <laughs> uh, communication. Communication is really important. And being in a safe space. So maybe have meetings about. So uh, we do agile and we have retrospectives. So you, you, you reflect on the last two weeks. I think it's really important to think of, of the good things and the bad things. And, and, and it's a learning experience for everyone, not just in code, but also it makes you a better person to be a better pair, I think. Yeah. So I pair a lot. And oh, cool. One thing I do when I'm in a group, I'm lost because I'm trying to get people will fight longer to prove who's right. So like, let's tell you wait 15 minutes. Yeah. And then we'll try my way for 15 minutes, and then we'll learn. That's really interesting. I'm in a team right now, and there's, I can't. I'm not lying to you, but there is literally no disagreements, and I can't pinpoint why. <laughs> I think it's being a little bit more relaxed. I think I've, I've said it before where um, everyone speaks differently, so every, it's okay for everyone to code differently, and it's okay for other people to have different opinions, and it doesn't have to be one way. It can, it, you try and be a bit more flexible, try and get everyone to be a bit more flexible, as long as it's well-tested and it works. Um, yeah, maybe maybe be a bit more laid back. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned in the talk that uh, the things you were sort of initially focusing on were immutability, um, or you know, avoiding exceptions and, and, and function signatures. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned that that was because uh, you wanted to have the most impact. You focused on stuff that had the most impact. Uh, I guess my question is, in terms of like your team, your team's kind of continuing evolution of the code base and like learning together and this kind of work. How do you? Um, so, I joined a team that's pretty functional about a year ago now, and they're all pretty set. And I think for me, it was, right, what do I start learning in order to add value to the team? Um, I haven't really been at the forefront of the decisions um, yet, um, but I, get, I, get, I guess it's just a big conversation, um, everyone listing their priorities and kind of coming to some kind of decision. Yeah, it was a bit of a different angle for me. Yes? Um, it's definitely something um, we notice with hiring, just enthusiasm, um, and then going on from that, I think it's important to introduce a lot of these learning techniques in your work life, because everyone's always learning. Um, 
so it makes sense to have it as part of your work, as part of your job to keep learning. Um, something that I've really pushed for in my current role, current job, is um, we're not allowed to call them hack days, but they're definitely hack days. They're discovery days. Um, <laughs> uh, and just giving you a chance to learn. So somebody can either take um, that as personal time to go through um, a course if, if there's a certain topic they want to go into, or they can learn a new technology and apply it to something that might be useful for the team. We've kind of got um, a Slack bot going at the moment where people add um, features they want using um, technology. So. Um, I think allowing some space, we also had a lunchtime, so I mentioned the red book, uh, we also had a lunchtime um, where you come with your lunch and you go through the book. That I think it can work in the right circumstances, it didn't work for us. Um, and yeah, just allowing it within work and then if they're inspired then they might go home and do some studio. I, no I notice I will go home and do more if I'm inspired in work. Is that everything? Oh, yeah. Um, I, Scala is pretty much the only language I really dug into and learnt properly. Um, so I'm kind of biased. I really, really enjoy learning Scala. I think having all the maps and the, and the flat maps and the four comprehensions and all that good stuff is um, really interesting. I find it more of an academic problem sometimes when I have a, um, a solution to write. Uh, but that's my maths head talking. Um, I don't know if that, if that, I probably didn't answer your question, but we can talk later if you're, if you're around. Um, okay, I guess everyone wants to go and play games and stuff, so thank you. <laughs>